and we're live. Good afternoon. A couple of minutes past 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and uh, this is another webisode of uh, Hacker Hotshots. And we're very lucky we've got Phil Young with us. Phil, where, whereabouts on the planet are you? I'm on the West Coast uh, near San Francisco. All oh, right, so you're, you're uh, relatively early then today. Well, it's yeah, nine yeah. for you. But we chatted a little earlier, so I guess you were up, but you got a kid, so. No, I got a kid, I had a dog, so. No sleep. <laughs> That's good. All right, so Phil's, uh, the, the presentation today is mainframed the secrets inside that black box, and um, Phil is a senior security analyst. So, Phil, thank you very much for joining us, and you know, share whatever you want to share with us about yourself, and when you're ready, jump straight into the presentation. All righty, so. Um... So, I mean, I'll just jump right in because I have a slide about myself. But really, uh, long story short, I got into mainframe security about two years ago. There was no one really in that space. I was working with people who were mainframe security people, but they didn't speak sort of the same security language that other people in the security space sort of speak. They spoke mainframe, and I spoke network security. And that sort of started leading me down this path of, of like, well, what, what's going on in that space, and, and why is there this gap and this disconnect? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of... Sort of a little bit about me briefly, um, and then I'll get started here. I'll share my screen. Let's see here. Share my. I'm going to pop off the screen, but I'll be listening in, and I'll jump back in towards the end. Okay. Uh, can you guys see this? I'll go for it again. No, I didn't see it. Put it through. Oh no, you guys can't see that. Okay, let me move it to the right space. I don't know what's going on here. Um, I tried putting it on a separate screen and I don't think it worked too well. Let's see here. Sorry everyone, we'll get this going. No worries. And then we should be able to do this now. Let's share the screen. And everyone can see this? Yep, that's perfect. Okay. So this is sort of a, a hybrid of the talk I did at ShmooCon and the talk I did at, um, at ThoughtCon. I spent a lot of time putting slides together at ThoughtCon, so I wanted to make sure they got the benefit, you know, artwork-wise, so I wanted to make sure they got the benefit of being shown. So a little bit about me. Um, like it was mentioned, I'm a senior IT security analyst. Uh, since the movie Tron and War Games, I was fascinated with mainframes. At the time, I didn't really know what a mainframe was. You just sort of hear it referenced in a movie. And they're really just mentioning computers, but mainframe sounds cool. Um, but I got the chance to play around with them, play in quotes, on, uh, on X25 networks like Datapack or Telenet. Um, and there's a great report, if you want, about uh, what's still on Datapack, if you want to you follow up with me after the talk. Uh, like I mentioned, ever since I got interested in mainframes and, and security on mainframes, I've given talk at B-Sides Las Vegas, B-Sides Austin. I gave a talk at ShmooCon, ThoughtCon. I've given talks locally to local hackerspaces here. Uh, really, I'm just trying to drum up interest in people doing research in this space. Uh, so what do most people think when I say the word mainframe, right? When you say the word mainframe, they usually think something like this, right? A giant fridge-sized room, a computer, or multiple fridges. It's got some tape wheels. It's got a giant printer. It's got chairs from the 70s. It's got a console or two. It, you know, this is what people still think of when they think of a mainframe. Or maybe, you know what? They just don't even know what to think. They just think it's this horrible black box that they're not allowed to touch because it sits on the network, but, oh, it's legacy and you're not allowed to even look at it. Um, or maybe they think of this, right? They think of this system where, where it's got, like, some kind of old-school green screen and you log in and it's all text-based and you still have these things you have to enter and it looks like, you know, you're working at Costco. Um, but in reality, modern mainframes were an operating system called ZOS. Uh, it was released in late 2011. They do a refresh about every two years. It's a modern OS. It's not, it's not, you can't think, it's not like it's running Windows NT, and you can't really call it legacy. I like to think that, that calling it legacy, calling ZOS mainframes legacy is like calling Windows 8 legacy because it has part of the Windows NT kernel still in it. You know, there's some code still left over. That's not really the case. It can support all your modern password controls and security requirements in the OS itself. So there's no reason why it really should be called legacy at this point. 70% of Fortune 500s are running an IBM ZOS mainframe. Uh, if you ask IBM, it's more like 90% of Fortune 100s are running an IBM ZOS mainframe. But either way, either way, it's a, it's a large number, and they're generally using it for the critical business functions. So they're not going to be using it to run like an intranet website. I mean, some might, 
but generally they're not using it for non-critical things, but they're using it for real critical business function like logistics, or they're using it for things like, um, like payroll, keeping track of your bank transfers, how much debt you owe, how much you owe to the school when you graduated, those sort of things are what's being tracked in these mainframes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is still the predominantly way to interact with the mainframe. It's going to be a green screen and TSO, and I'll get into that in a little bit here. So uh, it's not really that mysterious, right? So it's got commands. You can ping. You can do an NS lookup. You can even do remote shell into other machines. It, it's just an operating system just like anything else. But other than the fact that you're watching this talk, why should you care, right? Uh, other than the fact that I just talked about it's a company's key system. It's not going to have, you know, it's not it's not really going to be running non-critical functions. If someone's paying a couple hundred million dollars for a mainframe over decades, it's going to be running critical things. Other than the fact that it's, it's never really been under some real security scrutiny, right? Like the security community's never really had a chance to touch them, never had a chance to look at them or do anything with them. And besides the fact that it manages my pay, my flights, and whatever, right? Um, and Arby's apparently has one for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, it's this graph. This graph is what, is what really alarms me. What this graph represents is the IBM security admin age um, total. So 75% of them are older than 50 years of age. The average age is 55. Now that's alarming to me only because we're going to be losing all of that knowledge in 10. If already we're starting to see it. I'm starting to see people retire out of the community. Um, we're going to start losing all this knowledge. It's going to disappear. Not only that, but people who are of this, in this age group they grew up in the mainframe environment, but weren't necessarily exposed to the other sort of environments that are outside the mainframe. So all this network security stuff that came up in the last decade and a half or so, uh, really they didn't have much exposure to because the mainframes were sort of walled off from that environment. And, and what that leads to is that leads to this sort of scenario, right? So this is, honest to God, this is a post I saw on mainframe gurus. Someone just posted a simple question. How can I tell what the server name is if all I have is the IP address? And they got three answers. I don't think it's possible. This is in 2011, by the way, so this is recent. Uh, you, you need to write your own program to be able to do that. Uh, or I only know of these four networking commands. Would one of these not work? And, uh, and traceroute would work, but that's the most roundabout way to ever do that when you can just do this. Right? You can just do an NS lookup on an IP address, and it returns the server name. So, so that's sort of what I'm talking about. There's, there's not the expertise in this space, and the expertise is starting to retire out of the industry. Uh, so let's talk about Mainframes 101 for a bit, okay? We're going to talk about a little bit about, uh, about how to interact with it and how to use it. So generally, you use TSO, right? So it's what you use to, what you see mainframe administrators using to interact with the mainframe. It has commands like FTP, Netstat, Rexec. It has like some sort of GUI called ISPF, which is not great, but it's as good as you're going to get. Um, lets you browse files, edit files, and all that stuff. What's interesting about TSO is the username max is seven characters, period. You cannot have more than seven characters in your username. I don't know why. That's usually OK, because companies, you know. But it still limits the space that you need to enumerate. Uh, and also, password max uh, is eight characters. And I'll go why once I get into how the password is being stored, why it's eight characters. But it has an eight character limit. Uh, also, it's limited to these special characters, so eight through Z, zero through nine. Uh, and then these three, what IBM calls international characters, it's just three special characters. I don't know why it's limited to that, but that's just, just the way it is. Uh, but see, it's just a command prompt. Like I showed you earlier, you can ping, you can do an lookup. You can also do things like I wrote a script that just rep takes a number and spits out the hex value. Um, I wanted to show some pretty graphics or whatever on the screen. So, I mean, all I'm doing is instead of like dot slash, I just type exec, then the data set, which is the equivalent of a file, so that's all up here. And then the number, and it spits out what I wanted it to spit out. It's not really all that terribly special, but it's just demonstrating that you can, you can do things on the mainframe, just like you can do them in Linux and Windows and all that stuff. Uh, speaking of, uh, it has, this is usually the part that blows people's minds when I'm talking about mainframes. Um, it comes with Unix. Now, when I say it comes with Unix, it's actually running a POSIX environment, virtualized sort of inside ZOS. They don't call it Unix because that would be way too easy for anything to be called what it's supposed to be called. They call it OMVS. Um, you can sudo root without a password if you're part of this group. But it just looks like Unix. It has normal U Linux commands, you know, ls, ssh, ssh, copy, cat, whatever. Um, you can compile things with the C compiler. You know, it's fairly standard. Uh, but you can also run TSO command from this environment. 
So you can run slash bin slash TSO is built in. There's also a rec script that IBM released that lets you run authorized commands. So what that means is, so here's, for example, I'm in Unix on the same system. I'm doing a uname, just showing you the kernel, you know, not that big of a deal. Uh, I do an ls, and then you can see the script TSO command. I run that command with a TSO command rvary. Spits out the, the results straight to my screen, and then I just do an ID to see what username I'm running under. It's really not, I mean, like I said, it's just running Unix alongside the TSO environment. It's just sort of all sharing an environment. Now, mainly people, except for Unix, which has an SSH, mainly people are using TN3270 to interact with the mainframe, so they're using those screens, the ISPF editors, and all that stuff. Um, that protocol is really just an extended telnet, so it's really clear text going over the wire. IBM recognized this and released SSL for it in the mid-90s. Uh, in my experience, only about half of places are running a, an IBM mainframe with SSL enabled. And if they have SSL enabled, uh, they may also have non-SSL enabled, and people are still using the clear text connection. Uh, the default ports, in case you're running a port scan and you see this, are 23 for Telnet and then 992 for SSL. Companies, for whatever reason, still think that security through obscurity is happening. So they may also do things like put it on port 2323 or some weird weird ports, but it's not really difficult to find with them. Uh, this is what it looks like. You can sniff it with Wireshark. Uh, it looks awful when you sniff it with Wireshark, but you can follow the stream. Here you can see I logged into the master of the mainframe. IBM puts a contest on every year, so I got an account and, and competed. I won a t-shirt. But uh, this is my login to the mainframe. You can see here I'm entering my password, and it, it has all this information about your logon screen. So here's the important important bit there, though, is the fact that it has EBCDIC down here, because that's what the mainframe talks in. It doesn't talk in, of course, ASCII, because that would be too easy. So I'm going to talk about RACF. RACF is really the security database on which everything is sort of stored and secured. So it contains everything from your password to your permissions, your user ID, what access rights you have. Do you have access to run jobs? Can you execute commands? That controls everything on the entire mainframe is managed through this one database. So think of it more as the equivalent of the, the admin database in a database. So like MySQL will have an admin database with tables and all that, what, what users are allowed to do, and you grant privileges. It's the same concept here, except it's doing it on a file system instead of doing it on a database. Uh, super user access, there's no, no concept of root. There's no concept of uh, anything like that. There's a concept of special. So what special means is, is you might not have access to all the files on the mainframe, but you have the ability to grant yourself access to anything on the mainframe. So while you might not have access to a specific file, you can just change your permissions to give yourself that access. And, and frankly, only a few people need this level of access. So if you're looking at a mainframe, you're doing some kind of audit, you really need to make sure that no one has this level of access. Now speaking of, you really need to make sure that no one has access to the RACA database itself because it contains the password hashes. And I'll talk about why that's important later. But you would think that this database this database that has everything in it that's super secure, it's got all the password hashes, you know, it's really, it'd be really protected while protecting the impossible to find. Not true. All you need to do is run the command rvary, and it'll, like you saw in my previous slide with TSO command, all you need to do is run this command rvary, and it tells you exactly where this database is. So you can do an easy check if you've got a mainframe on your network or you've got access to a mainframe, you can type rvary, and it shows you where things are located you can make sure that only the people who need read access have read access. It should really be limited to a very, very, very few select people, and maybe some programs like generic program IDs. But it really needs to be locked down. Access to this database is no longer acceptable. So let's talk now. We're going to move on. So now you guys are mainframe experts. Everyone now knows everything there is to know about mainframes. So I'm going to move on to, to sort of some security testing and whatnot. Uh, it's very frustrating. I can tell you from personal experience that when I first got into this about two years ago, it was super frustrating. Uh, tools don't work or don't exist. Like I'd find tools from 2002 that were supposed to work and don't work, can't compile. Um, information on the internet is way out of date. So I might, I might do a specific search for a specific term and it comes up that that, that just doesn't exist anymore. That, that concept was removed in another version of ZOS and now it's no longer applicable. Um, and the frameworks generally don't include ZOS for anything inside that platform. So like, for example, Metasploit, Nessus, Nmap, they really don't have anything that covers ZOS at all. So here's me looking on, so like the newest version of Nmap. I'm doing a search for any scripts 
that have anything to do with mainframes. I couldn't find anything. Same thing with Nessus. I couldn't find, like, it's, it's, it was almost impossible. I couldn't find anything for ZOS and Nessus. And I recently got into a discussion with Jack Daniel about, about oh, it, it does have mainframes. No, it doesn't. Um, Nessus has a bunch of AS400 checks, so, like, I-series mainframes, but they're not really mainframes, they're like, mid-frames. Um, but essentially, uh, there's nothing for the Z-series or ZOS, which we're talking about, on any of these tools. Uh, same thing for Metasploit. There's nothing on Metasploit for ZOS, nothing for 3270, nothing. Uh, nothing for Kicks. There's nothing. Even on Packetstorm, there's not nothing available to, to run to sort of help you test these mainframes. Uh, but it turns out, as I was looking, doing more research in this space, uh, making tools was super easy. You know, Python makes it very easy. Uh, updating tools was easy, so updating tools that currently exist to add support into these mainframes. And the reason is because the mainframe really wasn't, hasn't been really scrutinized as part of a security environment in the past. So things that, that have been fixed and taken care of for like 10, 5, 10 years are still applicable on the mainframe and you can use and all it does is need to update some tools or write some new tools to take advantage of these situations. So for example, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools that exist and then I'll talk about some custom tools that don't exist that I, that I wrote. So Nmap, Nmap sort of works, right? So when you, when you run an Nmap scan, it does identify a mainframe, right? It'll tell you IBM OS 390, and it'll tell you the version of the, the FTP server, so on and so forth. And that's, that's great. Um, except OS 390 was decommissioned in 2004. Like, I mean, end of life in 2004, no longer exists. The 90 in OS 390 stands for 1990s, right? So that it was, it's gone. It no longer exists. So I thought, well, that's ridiculous. So how am I supposed to know if it's really running OS 390 or whatever? I prefer to tell, tell it like, what the modern OS it's running. So I wrote an update to Nmap. Um, all it does is change OS 390 to ZOS. It's not really a huge change. It's not even a code change. It just changes some entries in the database. Um, this is available on my GitHub. It's easy to pull down. All it does is it does a cosmetic change. Now, I've submitted this patch to MAC group, but it got rejected because technically they want, it, they want to see it say IBM ZOS or OS 390 or SNA Telnet B because chance, you, know, you may encounter OS 390 and they want it to be exact. But either way, it's an easy patch to apply, and you can download it from my site. Uh, and I was also frustrated by the lack of you know, any, any NMAP scripts, so I decided to write one. Um, all it does is really not that complicated. It was more just to see how difficult it would be to write scripts that connect and do things on a mainframe. So all I did was write this script. It connects. It takes a screenshot. It doesn't do anything terribly special. Um, all it does is, and, but however, it runs an external program, so I can't include it with Nmap. Uh, it runs S3270, so it runs that, grabs a screenshot, and saves that to an HTML file. Uh, Edercap, so thanks to Dear Colia, who, who works for OpenWall, part of the John the Ripper team. Uh, he actually took a, a program that I wrote and added and retooled it to work in, in Edercap. So now if you have Edercap running, you can now be sniffing TSO login credentials straight off the network. It, uh, it works. I've tested it. Um, so long as it's clear text, there's no problem. You'll start getting mainframe credentials straight off the network. John the Ripper, so this, sort of, this is what sort of kicked off all my research in this space. Um, I was working on a project, and I had heard that it stores the passwords in DES, which it does. So, uh, so I was like, well, there's got to be a way to crack these passwords. And so working with, with Drew Coley and Nigel Pentland, we were able to get um, John the Ripper support added for RACF databases. What you need to do is you need to convert the RACF database, so you get a binary copy of the database and you can convert it with RACF to John. So what that does is it, takes, it strips out all the user IDs and the hashes, and then you can just run that in, in RACF. RACF now supports the kind of cracking that it does. I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but it's DES, but they do some obfuscation into what, what, it, what gets put into the path, into the, uh, the hashing algorithm, right? But it, all it does is it you know, XORs each letter with X55 and then shifts it one bit. So that's all that the RACF John plugin does. Um, so now this is this is a good. This is the, probably the first thing I noticed when I started messing around with these things. This is what it looks like when you log into TSO with a valid account. So it asks you to put in a user ID. So you put that in, and it brings you to this panel. This is the TSO logon panel, right? This is what it looks like 
when it's got a bad user ID. So a user ID that doesn't exist on the system. Now take a look at this screen and see what the difference is and what's wrong. Right? So you have this one, there's nothing at the top, and you have this one, and I'm going to highlight it for you, make it perfectly clear what I'm talking about. Basically, the login panel tells us if a user ID is valid or not, which is not really great practice in this day and age. If there's any web pen testers listening in, they'll know that user enumeration is super easy. If you tell me if a user ID is invalid, then I can start enumerating all the users on the platform. This is hard-coded into the panel. It's unchangeable. I have tried to change it. I have done research. I have not been able to figure it out. If someone does know a way, tell me. I'll blog it. We'll get stuff going because this needs to change. Um, this has been around forever, though. This has been around for a long time. But tools that, that I generally think of being like the go-to tool to do any kind of user enumeration or brute forcing don't support this, this platform. So there's no, there's no plugins for THC Hydra. There's no plugins in Medusa. And so I decided to take it upon myself to see how hard would it be to do that. And it turns out it's not very difficult. I wrote a Python script called TSO Brute. It uses X3270 or S3270. And it takes advantage of this friendliness. Um, it's very, very slow. Really, really slow. Uh, it's more proof of concept than anything else, but it, it, it can get the job done. It ignores valid TSO user IDs. So invalid, sorry. So what does that mean? So TSO has a specific rules for, for IDs. So instead of making you make a user list and making you sort of conform to the rules, you can just use any user list and it'll just ignore users say it's longer than seven characters or starts with a number. It'll ignore those so you don't have to worry about it. So this is what it looks like here. Um, you run it. It connects. It has to get to that login panel with a fake user, and then it just starts going through, you know, every every user in that list, and then it'll tell you, "Hey, I found this username. I found this username." Now it has a new. Now the default mode is brute force. So what it'll do is it'll, it'll find a user, and then it'll start trying to brute force the password. Um, that's fine. I prefer. I just was showing an example here of enumeration mode, just to so that it's possible to do the enumeration, but it also works in brute force mode. Now, earlier I mentioned that, that it's a clear text protocol, right? So it's using clear text. Uh, so I decided to write, I just wanted to see how difficult it would be to be able to sniff these passwords. You saw HaterCab now supports it. That's because I wrote this tool called MF Sniffer. Don't use it. It's horribly slow. It'll eat up all your memory because it's using Scapy and it's just gathering a billion packets. It'll eat up all your RAM. Use HaterCab instead. But it was more proof of concept, so I wanted to talk about it. This is what it looks like. Um, I'm a big fan of ASCII art, so... So there you go, and that's all it does. It just sniffs passwords. Um, now on the mainframe, so I've talked about stuff that you can run to get access to the mainframe. On the mainframe, you can write your own tools as well. You saw I wrote a script that just converts a number to hex. Uh, basically, there's really two scripting languages. There's C list, which I think stands for command list. It's really just like a bash script, and rex. It's more like Perl or Python. It's a little bit more abstract. So you, you write things. So I wrote a script called prex. Uh, it's a script. All it does is it pings a slash 24 for host. So sometimes mainframes will be dual homed, and you can use this script to sort of find stuff that you might not have access to otherwise. So it's externally exposed, and now you can connect in, and you can start scanning an internal network. So you just enter the range, and it starts doing the scan. Also, Netcat. So Netcat, I was able to do a minor change, uh, get Netcat for OMVS to compile. So what I did was I took Netcat, and I added a make OMVS make command to it. Uh, however, it includes the dash E or the gaping security hole. So, so you want to want to be careful if you're putting this on your system, but you can upload it, compile it in OMVS, and now you, you have Netcat able to do some kind of networking commands. Only problem is, if you want to talk to it, you need OMVS to talk to it because it's all in EBCDIC. So what does that mean? So here I am on OMVS. I ran Netcat on a listener on 12345, and I'm executing the bin ID command. So I just want to see the ID of the user. Uh, I connect to the mainframe on port 12345 from a Linux machine, and it looks like garbage. Like, look at this garbage right here. That's awful. That's awful. That doesn't mean anything. OK, fine. I know DD does a conversion, right? So you can see here, and then I pipe it to DD. I convert it to ASCII, and it comes out, and it tells me the user ID and the group ID, which is great, right? That works. But it's not. you can't do anything interactively. I think there might be some sort of bash foo I could do, but ah, that's horrible. So I decided, so this is the opposite example. I can do a shell in, in my, this is OMVS running here through Telnet, and then OMVS on the mainframe here. I connected with Netcat, and then I can do, you know, sort of the same sort of commands and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but having to run your own mainframe 
just so that you can talk to a netcat session is horrible. So I wrote netcat and no net cat. It uh, that's all it does is it connects it it connects to an IP address or a host name, connects to a specific port, and gives you the exact same functionality that netcat would. But now you don't need to do any translation. It does the translation for you. It has a listener mode, so you can listen for incoming connections. It also has this uh, stupid logo, uh, dash D for dyno, so you can see like a nice little little logo before you connect. Um, and that's sort of what and it comes with the netcat for OMVS on my GitHub. So it's already there in the Python script folder. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about Shodan real quick. Uh, Shodan now supports looking for mainframes, so you can look for some of these terms, and then uh, and then using uh, the nmap script, you can start grabbing some screens, right? So you can search for terms like FTP, CS, version one, or whatever, and then you can start grabbing some mainframe screens. So here are some examples of screens I've been able to grab. So there's the University of Chicago, um, the Information Technology Services. What's interesting about this is it tells you exactly what it's running, the operating system, and all that stuff. I don't know why. Sometimes you see this. I don't know why they feel like they need to tell us what they're doing or what the specific LPAR is. Or there's just a lot of information on these screens. Uh, for example, this one for the Illinois State University uh, tells us exactly how long the minimum length of a password is six, and it must contain one numeric. So probably a lot of five character passwords and then the number five or six after it. Um, this one is, is interesting. I don't know. I just found this one. It's the Isuzu North America Network, which is, I don't know why it's available online. Um, I guess you could do some kind of like, I don't know, dealer work or order cars or whatnot. Um, interesting enough, they tell you exactly how to get to the TSO prompt so that one you could enumerate users on. You could just type TSO in the command, you know, user ID or anything required, and it takes you straight into that environment. Uh, and finally, so. So part of the research, uh, part of the challenge of doing research is it's hard to get access to a mainframe, right? It's very expensive to set up and, and so on and so forth. That's what I've been told. Uh, but that's no longer the case. Hercules is a, is a really good emulator for emulating mainframe architectures. Uh, it supports the ZOS architecture. Uh, it's updated and maintained constantly. They have their own GitHub page. It's fantastic. And it's an open source software, so you can run it on anything. I run it in Ubuntu. It's really great. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, you have your, your sort of, I'm running Hercules here, and I have a connection to the master console here to be able to execute some commands and whatnot. But ba basically, that's what it looks like when you're running Hercules. It's, it's great. Um, and so that's about it. There's not, I mean, that's, a, that's about it for the presentation. Uh, a special thanks, though, I want to say to Diru and Nigel. So Nigel really helped me get kicked off, and I emailed him. He's the first person I really emailed about asking questions, and he really helped me get interested in all this stuff. And Diru Coley as well. Um, without his help, some of these tools would not have been updated. I'm not a C programmer by any means, and so without his help, Intercap would not be supporting you be running my crappy tool. Uh, and also, I want to make a special thanks to the R packs from, uh, from 16colors.net. I have a full list of all the R packs I use, but I don't know if you could tell, but a lot of my, my talk is uh, ANSI art. And so here's a list of all the, all the list of people and groups that I used to, to make this presentation happen. Here you can see this is uh, all the sites and stuff you want to be able to go to. So I have a BBS set up with all my files and scripts uh, just for nostalgic purposes. Uh, you can email me at mainframe767. Uh, Twitter, you can follow me, mainframe767. Same thing, blog. My, I, I use a Tumblr. It's, it's just easier for me to set up. And then GitHub is github.com slash mainframed. And uh, I also have an image UR where I store all of the screen grabs that I grab off of mainframe, so you can go check that out. I have, I think, just shy of 200 on there. So, uh, so that's about it for the talk. Uh, I think there may be questions. Let me exit out of this and, uh, and get back into the talk here. There you are. Coming back. Oh, Phil, let me just invite you back in. Hold on, please. Oh, there he is. Oh, sorry. It looks like my uh, my Google Talk plugin crashed. So I don't know what that means, but uh... no worries. All right. So, Phil, thank you. That was uh, a very comprehensive um, presentation. I've got a, a couple of questions that have came that came in here, um, and I'll just read them out as they came in. Are industrial SCADA systems considered as being mainframes? I don't think so, no, because those are more industrial control systems. So they're more purpose-built at the time. I'm sure there might be some. 
that were mainframes because that was the predominant OS at the time when the like like if you have a nuclear power facility built in the 70s, it might be running on mainframe. Mm-hmm. But uh, generally today, it's going to be running on a modern OS on Windows or or Linux or maybe Unix sort of architecture. Okay. Um, every system can have zero-day vulnerabilities, and with this, with that in mind, do you think it is possible to hack an IBM Z system? Yes, I can't. Oh, well, I mean, if you've been following me on Twitter and you've been following the talk about the logic of breach, uh, which happened in uh, a couple of months ago, the investigation is still ongoing. Uh, there are zero days. It's just that no one's really taken a look at these systems, but certainly there are things that are, are there are O days available for mainframes. You mentioned before the you know the sort of the key two problems here is a lack of expertise and no tools, right? And in regards to the lack of expertise, is there any mainframe security training courses out there that you're aware of? Not, and not the, sort of the context that we're talking about. Yes, there are mainframe security courses, but they're more geared to security on the mainframe, like limiting user access or or preventing people from getting access to specific data sets or databases or or how you know access is managed. Now Stu Henderson runs a great course. He was the first course I took. He has a fantastic course on securing and auditing. Uh, RSH Consulting also has great courses. They have also all their slides on their website. It's also a really good resource for material. And IBM's Red Books are also great. They'll tell you straight up. If you're if you're setting up an FTP server, disable these things to prevent bounce attacks. So they know so they're sort of aware but is there one sort of place where I can go to learn how to, how to, how to hack, say, a mainframe? No, there's no real resources for that available at this point. Okay. Um, could a specific isolated mainframe computer be a victim of a DOS attack? Sure. I mean, there's no reason. It depends. I mean, if, if you're just eating up network resources, yes. Um, you could also... So, so back in the day, mainframes were sort of engineered to be resource, real resource specific. That's why they're called mainframe engineers and system programmers instead of administrators. They would they work the OS until it's perfectly tuned. So for example, connecting to the 3270 connection, you set how many max connections you want to allow to the mainframe on that port. And so what you do is you say, I have 5,000 employees. I'm going to double that number in case every all of them want to connect twice, and that's probably enough resources to make available to my entire company. Now you can take advantage of that and just eat up all those ports. Um, back in the day, so there's a reason why mainframes aren't allowed to be scanned by Nmap any. Well, they should be now, but back in the day, what used to happen is is every time you connect to a TCP port, it would kick off a job in the mainframe, and job queues are sort of limited in how big they could get, and it would kick off a job because you opened up a SYNAC connection. Well, it would send its ACK SYN back and then wait. Now, when NMAP scan, a SYN scan would open up that, that connection and the mainframe would wait two hours before it closed that connection. So if you scanned all 65,000 ports and it only had a job queue of, say, 45,000, you ate up the entire job queue for two hours, mm-hmm. basically not letting any job allowed to run. So basically, not letting stuff that is OS required to run allowed to run. So, so yeah, it's and I'm sure there's ways to DOS a mainframe today. It's just no one's doing research in that space. Okay, terrific, Phil. Thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us today. Really appreciate it, and you know, want to wish you continued success in all your research and uh, tool creation, and who knows what other magic you'll be uh, putting together in the yeah. in the upcoming uh, weeks and months and years. So it's, it's well, certainly you. certainly sounds like you've got a ton of opportunity here. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah all right. And, well, thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. And if anyone wants to help, I'm always looking for help. So. Sounds good. Terrific. Well, we'll, we'll, we've got a recorded uh, copy of this, and uh, we'll have all the the questions transcribed and all of your contact information. So, uh, you know, anyone who uh, wants to reach out directly to you can do so, and we'll have that information available for them on the page. Thank you so much. All right. Phil, have a good one, my friend. Have a good one. Thank you. We'll, We'll be in touch.